glory to Jesus Christ. Glory Welcome back. You are listening to The Voice of Reason. And on today's episode, we have a very, 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 very special guest. I would like to introduce all of you to Father Paul Varshola West. Father Paul, how are you? Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. I am doing very well. It's good to be here, and I'm glad we met uh, when we did, and uh, looking forward to talking today. Yes, yes, Father. So I've told the audience, the audience already knows, uh, for those of you uh, who keep a close eye on the content that we put out, uh, a couple of months back, if you remember, um, I went to New Jersey for the Byzantine Symposium, and I got to talk to all of the Catholic priests that were there, and one of them is none other than uh, <laughs> the West, and uh, there's a video that we did um, that's on the, on the YouTube channel where I'm speaking with all of the priests, and I think the very first one, the very first priest, right, was you, mm -hmm. Father, right? You're the it first yeah. in the video. Yep. Mm -hmm. Paul. So, um, so for those of you, if you saw that video to my audience, uh, they have seen you. They're already familiar with you. Um, so, Father, again, thank you so much for, for, for doing me the honor of, of appearing uh, here on the show. And uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell the audience a little bit about you. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So I um, was uh, born, baptized, raised uh, Byzantine Catholic, uh, whatever you want to call it, you know, as far as like being born and bred or or, or whatever. Um, so I was baptized. I always like to joke at the at the tender age of two weeks old. So my, my mom and dad wasted no time. You know, it was just like, you know, get that kid in the water now. <laughs> um, and so I grew up um, at the. Uh, Byzantine Catholic Cathedral of St. Michael the Archangel um, in Passaic, New Jersey. Um, that's where my family went for uh, a few generations. Um, and that's where my my parents still go um, today. Um, clearly, I don't go there anymore. Being a priest, I have, you know, <laughs> my own parish. But so that's where I was uh, born and raised. I was an altar server. I grew up in the faith. And then, um, you know, I have a story just like so, so many of us where I sort of only say, you know, ran hot and cold you know, with my faith and, uh, you know, went different ways and, and everything like that. And I ended up having a, um, I, I, at the risk of sounding arrogant, uh, had a pretty successful music career for a while. Um, and then, uh, ended up in my early thirties going to seminary, um, and, uh, you know, becoming a, uh, becoming a priest. So my, original academic background is actually, like I said, in music. Um, I have a degree, um, from Montclair State University in um, music theory. And then I have a Master of Fine Arts in music composition from uh, California Institute of the Arts um, in Los Angeles. And um, I specialized in a very, very esoteric American composer, which was my like academic niche. Um, so I have a couple publications that I wrote uh, and even a uh, uh, 2013 Grammy nomination. So like I had like an actual career Right, like <laughs> I see your face. Yeah, kind of. You it's kind a, of odd, a, right? a Grammy nominated recording yeah. artist, brother. Yes. Uh huh. That's uh, yeah. It was in the classical. It was in the classical daytime category, so it didn't make <laughs> it on TV. You know, <laughs> but nonetheless, yeah. So, so I had like, like I said, like I had a whole career. So it's not like I was. I, I always flirted with the idea of being a priest, but then, you know, at, at that time the Byzantine uh, Ruthenians weren't having married priests, right? And so I was, you know, in college and I met the woman who was gonna be my uh, my wife, you know, who would ultimately become my wife. And it wasn't necessarily like a, uh, oh, I'm going to simply like, you know, trade the priesthood for marriage. It was just like, oh, I'm getting married. This is what I'm doing with my life, right? And then, sure. you know, I was doing the music thing and um, having a, you know, having a decent time during that. But then, you know, life got hard. You know, you go through some struggles, you go through some changes and all these things. And then, uh, you know, I found um, myself being called to follow the Lord in some kind of deeper way. And I didn't know what that was. And then back in 2015, my mom called me. So I always blame this on her. It's her fault. She calls me and says, you know, um, uh, Pope Francis is going to change the, the rule, the quote unquote, the ruling on married priests and our priests can get married. And I was like, oh, that's funny. Bye, mom. And then she called me back and she says, you know, Mrs. Baranko said at your first Holy Communion, like when we still did that stuff, right? She goes, you know, Mrs. Baranko said you were going to be the priest of the class. And I was like, yeah, sure. That's funny, mom. Thanks. <laughs> and then, well, now here we are um, talking. I've been ordained about three and a half years now. Um, so that's, I, 
where I'm at. Yeah. I'm I'm fascinated. I had no idea uh, you had that that entire career before you became a priest. That's amazing. Yeah. So yeah. you so it, it's uh, is it classical? It's like a classical uh, compositions. Is that what you? Yeah, yeah. I was in um, and and this this could actually be a. I'm not inviting myself back on your show, but this could be like a whole nother topic. For yeah. Your show. But I was uh, yes. I I did um. Uh, a lot of what's known as um, microtonal music theory, which was like studying other cultures and other um, alternate tuning systems than what we find like in um, in the Western culture, uh, which was actually I found out like retroactively, I realized came from my growing up in the Byzantine church surrounded by the melodies that we have and the ethos right. of our chant and all this stuff. So I ended up my my uh, MDiv thesis was on uh, prostopinia on our, our plain chant and um, basically re-envisioning how to interpret this uh, from a, a musicological standpoint of like going back to the original sources and all these things. So very, very pretentious topic, very heady topic, <laughs> well, <laughs> know, but a uh, decent one nonetheless, I think. So. Well, Father, I, I am inviting you back on my show because <laughs> for the next one, I want to talk all about, about Byzantine music. Oh, there you go. If we can, yeah. So if that's also your specialty in music. <laughs> we got to talk about that. We yeah, have to. absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so that's like my, the, the short version of my story, you know, just a, a strange life. And I'll be honest, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, the, the Lord is guiding me. I'm just trying that to makes, listen. That makes two of us, Father. I don't know. No, I've never known what ever in my yeah. life. Do it. Yeah, That's exactly. Good. You know, just trying to follow the Lord and just trying to live live the life He's calling me to. You know, and and, and you know somehow somehow get into the the heavenly banquet, you know, along yeah. with my family. So that's, that's that's where I'm at in my life. That's beautiful, Father. So you've been a priest for three and a half years. Yeah. Um, so we know a little bit about your career before the priesthood. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your experience uh, in seminary. Tell us about your experience so far as as a priest. Mm -hmm. What has that been like? Well, this is this is actually a, a perfect way to transition right into today's topic because yeah. I was I like to joke I was raised in one church but then was ordained into another church uh -huh. um, because we you know I grew up growing up in the I'm going to age myself now you know growing up in the 80s um, <laughs> I, we were still in that very especially at my parish where I grew up in that Latinized mindset of the 1950s and uh -huh. 60s where you know the quote and i don't mean this in any kind of derogatory way but the ethos was you know catholic is catholic you know we traded some of our traditions for more western traditions and all these things and you know it was a thing it happened and and that's how i was raised and then like i said i kind of fell away from the church for a few years but then it turned out that was a very important time that i wasn't like actively practicing my faith because i come back and all of a sudden everything is different Things uh -huh. looked different. Things sounded different. Um, we had the new book with these new melodies in it, quote unquote, new melodies, right? And and there was a liturgical revival, and like I totally missed it, right? So <laughs> when uh -huh. I came back, I sort of had to like relearn, quote, my faith, you know, and relearn the expression of what it means to be a Byzantine Catholic. And uh, I'm not doing the story justice right now, but you know, so then in seminary, it was very hard for me for quite a couple, you know, few years to grapple with the idea of like what does it mean to be like small o orthodox right in our faith christians of the of the true faith right right believing christians what does that mean i thought we were we were catholic what's this o word orthodox you know and and i grew up in a realm where orthodox simply meant not catholic but then you come to realize that no that word the words catholic and orthodox don't need to be charged right it's simply um uh an expression, right? A true expression of a true faith and, and what that means, right? And that's all wrapped up in our liturgical expression. And I had to sort of relearn all this stuff and fought it for quite some time, you know, because when your worldview is rocked in any way, any way whatsoever, you know, you're going to fight it, you're going to squirm. But at the end, you grow and you learn and uh, God willing, you know, you become closer to the Lord. And that's what I've found in in my experience because i remember um when i first my um i'll make another confession um my wife is roman catholic so it's okay <laughs> Just, we joke we, we joke about that you know but yeah so she was raised roman catholic very very faithful uh very traditional um you know roman catholic family um so it's nice so it works you know uh so anywho um so i always joke about that you know and the first time that 
after we had gotten married that we started, you know, I returned to, um, to my faith. It's all, once again, see all the women in my life dragging me back into my faith. They know better than I do. Right. So, <laughs> you know, man out there, find yourself a good woman. She'll keep you on track. Oh, yeah. All right. So, um, uh, when, uh, we started going back. Um, I started attending St. Mary's in Hillsborough, where you and I had met, right, for the right. That assembly, right? right? right. And so I started attending there, and I'm looking around at all these, like, Greek-looking icons, and I'm like, what is, uh, you know, Troparia? What is it? What is all like, things I've never heard before? Because we always went to, when I was a kid, the, quote, 7 a.m. low mass, where... Uh -huh. You know, and that's when we still did that kind of stuff. So my perspective was completely off, completely rocked. And so then once I went to seminary, I really had to like understand these things and learn these things and and deeply internalize these things. And 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 I came to an interesting realization that, you know, nowadays what we're seeing specifically, I can only speak from the Byzantine Ruthenian, um, you know, uh, avenue because that's what I am. That's that's what I was raised. Um, where we're seeing this sort of like um, parallel to what happened in the very early church between the Jews and the Gentiles becoming Christians, right? And I, I wrote a paper on this uh, 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 quite some time ago, but it, I think is relevant nonetheless, um, where we see if we read in the Acts of the Apostles and in a couple chapters of um, Paul's letter to the Galatians, right? What we see is there's sort of this, this two different type of, of like gospel streams where uh, St. Peter pushing the one where it's like, no, in order for people to become uh, Christian, they have to become Jewish first, adopt the Jewish practices, become circumcised, and then they become Christians. Whereas St. Paul says, no, 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 you can't, you can't force all this stuff on, on people who don't understand what it means, right? They don't, they don't know. The Gentiles are completely separated from all this stuff, but that doesn't mean that they have to be excluded from salvation in Jesus Christ, right? So then in our church today, in the Ruthenian church, what do we see? We see two types of rediscovery. People like myself who were raised Byzantine Catholic and um, stayed in the faith and then um, are learning like, oh, wow, there's a richness, a deepness to our small o orthodoxy that, that we never knew, but we're rediscovering it. But then we have people coming who are perhaps Roman Catholic or Protestant or even unchurched discovering the same thing from a different angle. So ultimately, like what happens in scripture and what historically, you know, there's one gospel in Jesus Christ with two veins coming together. And that's the same thing here. Two different levels of experience coming together in the true expression of our faith in Jesus Christ. So I think it's a it's a beautiful opportunity that rather than like, you know, one isn't better than the other. They're just different. And like right. that's where we are. So we're all sort of, in a sense, relearning, quote, uh, you know, the the. Um, the liturgy together, you know, right. and exploring That's, this together. So right. So Father, so <laughs> last night I did my uh, my monthly uh, group Zoom call with my uh, my patrons. Okay. I have the most amazing patrons. They they support me. Mm -hmm. uh, they're subscribed to my Patreon, and every month, like I said, we do a, a group Zoom call. Mm -hmm. And the one last night was about it was almost four hours long. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and they can they can stay on talk mm -hmm. about anything and everything they, they they love it you know they love and i love it i love these zoom calls i could talk to them all night um if i wasn't old and tired um, but, um <laughs> so we're getting towards the end of the zoom call this is like three three hours in three and a half hours in maybe and uh one of my patrons asked me and, and she's like falling asleep but she's asking questions and she just tells me she goes hey um why are there rights in the catholic church what does that mean ah. this is that three and a half hours in and she was like like what are the rights like what are they and like why do we have them and like what what's the significance of them what 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 are the differences and this again this is three and a half hours in and we're all sleepy eyed and we're all and i went in and i gave my you know 10 minute explanation i was i was literally going through all of the regions and in you know uh in the mm -hmm. You know, in Asia Minor and in the Middle East, Africa, into Europe, and I was explaining all of the different rites of the church and and what they are and why they exist and um, and uh, you know, I was explaining that to them and they were just fascinated, fascinated. Mm -hmm. And then the next guy asked a question about the rites, and the next guy asked a question about the rites, and the next girl had something to ask about the rites. We they are fascinated by it. As a matter of fact, the number one question. The number one question that I've gotten 
uh, since I started this ministry, you know, after everyone found out that I was a, a Byzantine Catholic, the number one question that I've gotten is, um, what is Byzantine Catholicism? What is it? Um, so many Latin Catholics have no idea what it is, never even heard of it. Yeah. And now, because they've seen me talk about it, they've seen uh, the content that we put out uh, when we were at St. Mary's in New Jersey, um, they... They're like they're just fascinated, and they want to know more. They want to know everything about it, and specifically, they ask about the liturgy. They, yeah. the the um, the rites of the church are so foreign to a lot of Westerners that they ask. You know, I, I've literally gotten the question before. Uh, hey, at the biz in the Byzantine rite, do they do they have the Eucharist? <laughs> yeah, right, and, exactly. And, yeah, like, do they have the Eucharist? Do they do the consecration at the Byzantine rite? Do they do they read the gospel in the Byzantine rite? Like. That's the level of of a um, of familiarity that they, I guess, that they would have with the Eastern rites is they have absolutely no point of reference to it, and that's why I'm really glad that we're that we're able to do this uh, this episode today, Father, because uh, this right here, when people ask me that question from now on, I'm going to direct them right here to this interview yeah. to be talking with you, Father, because oh, because uh, I know that you are going to answer all the questions. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna uh, explain everything and uh I'm, I'm really excited so father i'm i'm finally gonna get to ask the question i always have to ask <laughs> i get to ask it now to a byzantine uh, catholic priest father what is the byzantine right of the catholic church uh, well okay that's a yeah that's a loaded question and so the first thing i always start out we have to um so Right, we're dealing with two different worlds here right so the the, the quote eastern orthodox world right it's all about mystery it's about experience it's about spirituality about this certain um intimate relationship between the individual and jesus christ expressed through communion uh in the eucharist but also communion in the holy spirit and communion in the church capital c right so it's this this mystical body right the true expression of a mystical body and not that it's bad or anything, but the more Western mindset is more of an academic approach, right? Of, well, intellectually, we want to know what is the Byzantine, right? What is the liturgy? Do you have this? Do you have that? And so it's a really neat thing to be able to say, yeah, we can talk about all this. We have the church fathers, we have modern theologians, we have modern liturgists, but once you hear this information, you come and see right? Come, check it out. Come to a liturgy, watch it in action, live the life, live the cycles of the church, because that's all tied into it. Now, I love this little image, right? We often say to explain like, oh, well, what is the quote, you know, uh, true faith, right? What is the apostolic faith? What does apostolic Christianity look like? It's like, well, we say it's the faith given by Jesus Christ to the apostles and taught and defended by the church fathers, right? But what that makes it sound like is <laughs> Jesus Christ took a book, handed it to the apostles, and then they photocopied it and handed it to the fathers. And then that's the book we have today, right? Mm. But that's not the case at all. It's actually like the complete opposite. So what we can think of is what we know today is basically a, sort of like a funnel where it just comes all down to us today from this giant conglomerate of like things happening. And over the course of about a thousand, 1200 years, it's kind of like funneled down right into the codified um, and simplified version we have today. So the best way for me to answer this is to present to you and to the, to the viewers today, um, the essay written by um, uh, Father Robert Taft of blessed memory, um, who was a powerhouse giant, um, in uh, liturgy and history. And um, his 1992 essay, The Byzantine Rite, A Short History, is uh, the work I'm going to be presenting um, in a nutshell today. Now, a funny story about this before we begin. You asked about my experiences in seminary, right? Well, this text, I'll just show a picture of it here, right? This text is um, has a very, very important memory for me uh, in seminary. My very first semester of my very first year, I was sitting in the library looking through this, this text. Just, I must've had a pain look on my face because one of the fourth year guys saw me and he goes, oh yeah, the Byzantine right. Yeah, the short history by Taft. Oh, he goes, Father Stell, who is our liturgical theology professor. He goes, Father Stell is gonna have you read that like five or six times over the next four years. And he goes, I'm gonna tell you, read it every single time because you're not going to understand it. You're not going to get it. And after the fourth time you read it, 
you're going to go, oh, so that's what he meant by the neo sabiotic synthesis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right. And so I see your face here, right? Well, what is that? Right. Well, so hopefully by the end of today, we'll have enough information to be able to discuss these things, right? And to to know what technically is happening in, in the liturgy, because that was my experience with this uh with this essay. Um, so I guess I'm gonna just jump right in and we'll uh we'll we'll get going here in the deep end and uh here we go. So Sure. Father Taft, right, he defines the Byzantine Rite as a liturgical system developed in the Orthodox Patriarchate of Constantinople that was gradually adopted in the Middle Ages by the other uh, Chalcedonian Patriarchates of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. Okay, so he says himself, right, of, of uh, what he, um, he says here, that in this hybrid of Constantinopolitan and Palestinian rites gradually synthesized during the 9th to 14th centuries in the monasteries of the Orthodox world, beginning in the period of the struggle with iconoclasm. So we're going to get with all of this, right? So that's his like official definition. But then he goes on to say, and this is hilarious. He says that this definition is a dry material description and that it fails to manifest its poetic richness, its intensity, its tightly woven unity of ritual celebration, ritual setting, and ritual interpretation okay mm -hmm. so that's what i was getting at with the whole yeah we can talk about this all day long but until we see it until we experience it until we practice it until we live it it doesn't have much meaning right, right. so what i'm hoping today is to give this this academic talk but then encourage people to go and see it for yourselves you know see it in action right to see what all of these crazy things mean and so in his quote, dry material description, right? Taft goes along to tell us about, you know, what makes up the quote Byzantine right. So he says, you know, there's this, this the uh, the core of it is all about liturgical texts, right? The prayers we pray, right? Because the, the liturgy is a, a physical expression of prayer, right? It's a physical, tangible, in time yet out of time uh, ex expression of prayer. So we have, two um sets of texts right we have the the ordinary uh text which he calls the invariable skeleton so this would be like the same prayers that you pray every single divine liturgy or every single time you pray matins or vespers or the one of the hours right that's the stuff that never changes but then you have the propers which go by each day and by festal periods so like for instance, we're just getting out of the period of theophany, right? So you have the troparia for the feast, which are only sung for, you know, eight days of the year or what have you. You're not going to sing those like on a random Tuesday in November. Right. right? You're not only going to sing those during that period. So they only yeah. show up in the skeleton during that time. And so. Father, I already know that people are going to ask, what's a troparium? Right. Okay, a troparion. Yeah, okay, so that's right. This is going to be having some more questions too, right? So that's uh, basically a troparion is a hymn, okay? Right. As that comes from uh, a, a specific uh, portion of, of the divine office. So, right, so there's going to be a lot of questions like this, right? And so then from, from here, right, so we have the skeleton that never changes. Then we have the stuff that gets inserted by the day. But then we have seasonal things, right? So we have the triodian, which are the hymns that are sung around the great fast, which is actually, we break open the triodian this coming Sunday. Uh, so that's, that's important, you know. So then we have also the Pentecostarian, which are the hymns that happen after Easter and uh, Pentecost. But then we also have the octoicos, which are the eight tones of what, you know, uh, that happen other times of the year not during the fast and not during the period after Pentecost, but we have the cycle of the eight tones where you might look in a divine liturgy book and see it says like tone one, tone two, tone three, something like that. That's where um, this fits in, right? So then from there, we also have the lectionary cycle, which are the readings we get. So there's two types of New Testament readings that happen in the divine liturgy. That's the epistle and the gospel. Right. So we have these two things. And then um, we also have the Old Testament readings, but they get um, I, I want to say they get relegated in the Byzantine right to the uh, to the divine office. So like at Vespers is where you'll get your readings, unlike um, in the Western 
uh, Latin liturgy, right? They have an Old Testament, an epistle, and a gospel. Our Old Testament readings just happen outside of that Sunday right. divine liturgy. Okay. And, so. and for those who aren't familiar with Father, what is Vespers? For those who aren't familiar. Oh, sure. Okay, so Vespers is the evening prayer of the church that happens the evening prior to the day. So like Sunday, um, you know, you would pray Vespers Saturday evening, and then Matins is the morning prayer on Sunday morning before you pray the divine liturgy. So that's, so, yes. So, so Vespers is the equivalent to the vigil mass for the Roman in the Latin church. Yeah, that, that's a that's a loaded uh uh what do you call it um equivocation there but yeah right so so that's what we see you know a westernization would be having that anticipated mass on um on uh saturday evening but yeah. like in the byzantine tradition you're you're praying vespers yeah that there's right. no it's a not you know non-eucharistic service you know it's a preparation right. for sunday yeah okay mm -hmm. right and so then now, so this is crazy enough, right? I'm saying all of these words that everybody's like, what is this guy talking about? Right. Well, of course, in order to drive this ship, right? There's something called um, the Tipicon, which is like the quote rule book. Okay, that's what it means. It's the, the book of rules. So that regulates this whole thing. So there's not too bad of a train wreck when you have a fixed cycle and a movable cycle moving around one another, all right? And so I like to say it's the priest's job to uh, be able to interpret this and to live this, but then also to guide his people to live it as well, where you don't have to worry about like the big ins and outs, like this priest should be guiding you, the priest should be talking to you, the priest should be educating and you know providing what needs to be done so that the people have all of this accessible to them. You know, um, so, so this is what we see today, but where did it come from, right? That's the question, all of these, pieces that make up the liturgy where did it come from well uh taft gives this great uh this great kind of breakdown okay it's very systematic he says there's um basically there's five periods so we have paleo byzantine <laughs> then we have the imperial phase the dark ages the studite era and the neo sabaitic synthesis right so there you go <laughs> there's that word so we have this is what words. i'm talking about this is what i want to learn okay exactly so so right we have um this uh this kind of framework here of the history right and we need to know this to really not only understand but to appreciate what we have today that like this didn't just fall out of the sky right the divine liturgy didn't show up one day i mean you're talking about we'll find out you know you're talking over a thousand years of of not only um you know prayer but of like reform of you know foreign intrigue murder um defending the faith you know um making a stance for what is right you know and all of these kind of things and we realize that what we have here is so precious what we have here is so important and we can't just you know take it for granted right not to the matter of fact that it's you know worship of of the true god but it's also carried by all of those before us who literally put their lives on the line and gave their lives so that we could worship the true God in a true manner. So that's, you know, it's, it's, it's really important. So the ironic part about this is we call it the Byzantine rite. Okay. We call it Byzantine, Byzantine, Byzantine. But the funny part is what we know as Byzantine doesn't actually happen until the city of Byzantium has its name changed to Constantinople, <laughs> right? So Taft points it out. So I'm not going to keep referencing Taft. Just know whatever I'm saying here yeah. is always referencing this one text. I'm not yeah. making this up. I'm not pulling it out of you know whole cloth here. I'm 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 just you know sort of I don't want to say regurgitating, but yeah. presenting right what Taft is is giving us right. So um, and and maybe just for for reference for the audience, the city of Byzantium is the city that became Constantinople. That name switch happened in the fourth century. Mm -hmm. And uh, that city is now known as Istanbul uh, so it's in, in, in Turkey, just so that people have a, a point of reference of, of where this originates. It's uh, Istanbul. Right. Per perfect. Exactly. Yes. And so, um, you know, this all, there's going to be some like historical dates that I'm throwing at you, but don't worry about the dates. It's just for like perspective for like the, the, the conversation. Right. Just like, oh, like, oh, so this happened around then this happened around yeah. here, you know, so, so we have a perspective. So like you said, so this happens in the fourth century, but you know, in, in the, uh, in the third century in 293 is where uh, Diocletian separates the empire from East and West. Right. So, so 
political geographical history goes hand in hand with all of this liturgical stuff because we see this in the in the church structure how the 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 emperors and the patriarchs you know are are very very working hand in hand and and there's all kinds of struggles there so in the late third century in 293 um we have this split of the east and west empire but it's not like definitive, definitive. Okay, we have an East and West until the death of uh, Theodosius the First in 395. So this is what we're looking at, right? So the core of this happens at this time. But now, um, what some historians will argue too is that there is like not this absolute definitive, definitive like East and West politically no longer integrate and no longer associate um, with Justinian the first in uh, around 527 to 565 right. um, is when so by that point there's absolutely no question that we have a sort of I don't want to say like hermetically sealed but a a Eastern Roman Empire right, right. ironically they didn't refer to themselves as Byzantines they called themselves right. Romans <laughs> they were Romans right, right. Um, so now what do we know about early liturgical forms? Well, the early, early, early stuff, like the first 200, 300 years, we don't, as Taft says, you know, we don't know too much, but we know enough. We know enough. But in regarding to what we would be able to know like today, right, like, like what we can recognize today as the divine liturgy, quote unquote, we see these first pieces in the homilies of Gregory Nazianzus and um, uh, John Chrysostom, right, in the late fourth century, but you know, pushing to the early fifth, you know, people are still talking about it then. But in their homilies and in their letters, we hear mentions of vigils, of stational liturgies or litanies and processions, like you would see in a Byzantine liturgy. We hear um, of the type of preaching that's happening. We hear that they're using psalmody. We hear about their chant tradition, okay? So we're hearing all of this. And then this is sort of, um, what do you say, solidified um, by the uh, what's known as the Codex Bartoborini uh, 336 from the eighth century. So this is the early extant Byzantine liturgical text that we have, okay? So that's the eighth century but it sort of encompasses everything these guys are talking about in the fourth century and the fifth century so we see this sort of um like um this strand right so you can see where this uh this codex came from through these homilies and um this is known as uh the right of the great church hagia sophia right um, so this is where now this is where it gets a little like intertwiny because as Taft would say these periods right that he gives right you have your uh, paleo byzantine but then the imperial era sort of like overlaps in the dark ages and all this you know so it's not a right. clear cut history which is what makes it so difficult to, to talk about this yeah. um, and, so, and, and would it be correct to say that the paleo byzantine era was everything that happened uh maybe before the split between east and west going back to the apostle andrew who brought the gospel to um, who brought the gospel to Byzantium, or is the Paleo uh, Byzantine era after that? No, I think I, I think we can we can stretch the Paleo to just be like everything like pre uh, like fifth century and before. Oh, uh, okay. okay. So like I think you know because in the beginning too, I mean, I mean the reality is you know in the beginning where did this all start? Right, Jerusalem, right, right. in that area. So it, it's not like you know we say Byzantine, you know, Catholic or the Byzantine, right? But it didn't really start there. You know, Christ was preaching in, you know, Galilee and Jerusalem and all of that area. So that's where it started and makes its way out as right. Paul is evangelizing and the apostles are are going out. So, right. correct. Because the reason the Byzantium had its name changed to Constantinople was because it became the capital of the empire in the in the fourth century, correct, is when that happened? Right, under Constantine. Right. And like any good emperor, yeah. you, know, you name the city, the capital city, you name it after yourself. Right. <laughs> why, why wouldn't you? I mean, that's a that's a good business decision, right? You'd be yeah. stupid not to, <laughs> you know. Um, and so that's why. So now, you know, we're talking about this 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 uh, Codex Barberini, which is extremely important because it gives us a snapshot of what's going on, you know, in the church uh, around the eighth century, but in a very specific manner, right? It gives us a snapshot of Hagia Sophia, which was like the great church, right? And so this was this was um, uh, constructed under the uh, auspice of uh, Justinian the first, right? So now we're in, you know, the 500s, right? Going right. going around there. Um, 
And so this is where we really see um, all the, you know, because the Byzantine right is known for its its splendor, right? It's it, 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 it's it's pomp, the vestments, the incense, right? The smells and the bells, right? As people like to say, right? The incense and the and the and the vestments and the candles and the smell and the the bells and the icons, right? And all this kind of stuff, right? So when we see this level of imperial pomp, right, it makes sense if the emperor is involved in making a liturgical setting where he himself is involved, right? So, so this is where we see Hagia Sophia um, uh, being constructed. Um, and now part of all of this ties into the Christological heresies and controversies at the time, right? Where we're, you're seeing people fighting the Arian heresies and then the Nestorian heresies and, and all of these things. So like the church is being influenced by this stuff almost to the extent that like, no, we have to make a stance for our orthodoxy, uh, you know, our right belief. We have to make a point to show that, yes, you know, Jesus Christ is the co-eternal son of God and we have to do this. So that's where we see not only the, the imagery um, being very important, but also things like making sure and adding in that the creed is an immovable part of the liturgy, right? The Orthodox creed, not the Arian creed or some Nestorian version or, or something like that, right? So that, but then we also see, um, you know, new chants being inserted during this time. So like uh, the Trisagion, your holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal is part of the liturgy. And then the um, only begotten son, him, right? That's very important for the for the Arian heresies, right? <laughs> Father, and, and if I if I yeah. could uh, mm -hmm. just say something, when I first you know started uh, attending the Byzantine Rite Parish here here in my hometown, mm -hmm. I was amazed by the hymns, the depth of the of the actual theology within the hymns of the doctrine. You yeah. have hymns that when you think of hymns, you think of hymns as something that's rhymy, that's something that's easy to remember, something that's uh, catchy. But the hymns in the Byzantine Church. They're, they they actually take the time the hymns and they, when you sing along you're actually saying you know that Jesus is consubstantial with the Father and that He is uh, Almighty God who became took uh, uh, took on human flesh and became man but He's still God and He's still man and He's and uh, the Trinitarian theology the Christology of it is so in your face it's there when you, when you read it, uh, it it's impossible to go to a Byzantine liturgy read you know sing along with the hymns and then walk out of there as a heretic or having a an Aryan view or an historian view of you or a non-calcedonian view of, of theology it's impossible because those those hymns are explicit and and this is exactly why is because yes they're a catechetical tool and, and obviously and, and and the hymns yes do have a, a certain level of catechesis but also it's a literally a defense of the faith Right. right. So like like the liturgy at that time, you know, you're looking in the fifth, sixth century, like it's a literal defense of the faith, because as we'll see, you know, it, it's not it wasn't a happy time for the church. Right. It wasn't a good time for anybody, really. <laughs> it was bad. And right. so, yeah, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I always <laughs> tell people, go to the Byzantine, right? And go to, you know, go to one liturgy, go to maybe a few liturgies. And after after the, the liturgy is over. You will walk out knowing exactly what Chalcedonian Christianity is, and you'll there'll be no question as to what is true uh, orthodoxy in regards to Christology. Exactly, yeah, exactly, right. And so then, like, also at during this time around the you know uh, fourth, fifth century, you know, a little later, we see then also like the Cherubicon, you know, now set aside all earthly cares, right? Let us who mystically represent the cherubim and yeah. sing the thrice holy hymn, and all, right? We see that entering in as well, but then this. Uh, also then goes into uh, this really, really cool thing that they used to do that we don't do anymore to the chagrin of many is what's known as stational liturgies. So uh -huh. do you know how if you go to a Byzantine liturgy, right, there's the little entrance with the gospel book and then the great entrance, right, with the with the gifts, as, as we can call them? Uh, well, what that is is actually the remnant of what's known as stational liturgies, where depending on the feast or the Sunday or, or what have you, what you would do is the liturgical celebration would start the night before in another church where you'd have, we have, you know, vigils, I just quote all night vigil. And there, you know, you're singing um, hymns, you're singing psalmody, but then at a certain point, 
there is a dismissal, literally, we call it a dismissal, right? There's literally an exiting from the one church and you would process through the streets to another church. And this is where you see, you know, most likely would be the cathedral. In this case, we'll just use Hagia Sophia, right? So then you would, you would process to Hagia Sophia. And at that point, right? So you're doing, as you're processing, you're doing the litanies because you don't need a book for that, right? You're saying, Lord have mercy, or you're chanting Lord have mercy or whatever. You know, they're clearly not speaking English, but you know, your, 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 your response is simple. And then you have the, the saltis, right? The cantor chanting the psalm verses and everybody's responding right through the prayers of the theotokos you know savior save us and you're repeating you're repeating and then you know you're singing uh only begotten son you're making a point because yes the the quote orthodox would be having their stational liturgies but then down the street the arians would be having theirs so they're singing their arian hymns we're you know singing the orthodox hymns you know and everybody's trying to make a point of who's right. And, and so then from there, the entrance, right? There would be this, this entrance into the church with the gospel book, with the emperor and the patriarch and their escorts and everybody and the, the people all enter together. So that's why we see um, these, these great uh, things happening in this, in, in the church, right? Where if you can imagine like if you go to a Byzantine liturgy nowadays, okay, you just see kind of like the priests like exit the holy place. They come down and they go back up and, you know, there's a prayer and a, and a blessing and all of these things. It loses some of that impact of like, this is when we would be entering into the church, right? Blessed is the entrance at your holy of holies now and ever and forever. Um, amen. So now um, what we also begin to see um, during this time is um, when when we have these like entrances, right? When we have these things of the church, what we see is a more a beginning of a more cosmic representation of the liturgy, where you know we refer to the church physically as a temple, but there were uh, some of the fathers, you know, they're they're really leaning into this. Not a temple per se, but the place in which. The, the heavenly liturgy and the earthly liturgy meet where time stops, right. right? Where we ascend to heaven and heaven condescends to us, right? And we have what's known as a, 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 a mystical typology, right? Or a mystical interpretation of what's happening. So for instance, the prayer that people don't get to hear that the priest pray, prays as, you know, people are singing and, and the priest is walking up the center aisle of the church, right? The prayer is, Lord, our master and God, who established the orders of angels and archangels for the service of your glory in heaven, make this our entrance and entrance of holy angels, come celebrating with us and glorifying your goodness, for you are holy always, now and ever and forever. Amen. So that prayer, right? Listen to the words of that prayer. Make our entrance and entrance of holy angels, you know, that we're asking the Lord to accept us as he accepts his angels, right? And and we see a lot of this in the um, mystagogy of Maximus the Confessor in around uh, 630, where we have this uh, mystical typology where, you know, we have that that saying when the, the legates from Constantinople went and, oh, we didn't know if we were on heaven or on earth, right? You know, right. that kind of thing. That's that's the experience, right? That's what we're, that's what we're going for. Right. But now, of course, you know, so we have this, if we can imagine it's the great church, this interpretation, all of these things, these stational liturgies where people are moving from one building to another. And then we have um, for the great entrance, the reason we have the great entrance with the gifts is because they were kept in a separate building and the clergy would go over at where the prothesis was done and they would process the gifts into the building and, and all of these things, right? All this pomp. But then things happen when this is why we don't have nice things <laughs> right history is always so so there's like a ton a ton of contributing factors here to to uh like political and historical factors that ended up uh, shaping the liturgy now i'm just going to kind of go over this quickly so we can move on to like the the real importance of what happens after the bad stuff right okay. so in around the seventh century, this is what Taft refers to as the uh, the Byzantine Dark Ages, right? He said it happened a couple of hundred years after the Dark Ages in the West, 
right? So what happens, we have several contributing factors. So one is the bubonic plague. So um, just under the, uh, what was it? It's uh, 30,000. They say just in Constantinople alone, roughly 30,000 people were lost because of the bubonic plague. So if you have death on that huge level, that's yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. You know, so that was a big blow to not only parishioner base and, dare, you know, I jokingly say, you know, tithing, right? <laughs> not only was it a big hit to the tithing, uh, we think we have problems now. Um, yeah. But yeah, so, so you know, you're talking about in one city, one metropolitan area, 30,000 people just gone. Okay. So that affects so much. Yeah. Um, and then politically, uh, Jerusalem, Alexandria, and Antioch are all lost to Muslim conquest. Right. So now Constantinople's it for the East. And they just lost, you know, 30,000 people in one city, you know? And, and so then that, and then what we see here is the great patristic era of the church fathers, right? Coming to an end, right? We see right. that, that sort of, uh, coming to a close, but then, you know, then there's the, um, Monophysite controversy with dealing with the nature of Jesus Christ. Was he truly divine and truly human, or did he have just one nature or two? And can those exist at the same time? So that was a blow. And then there was the Phocian schism. Uh, and then, and then the final blow comes with the uh iconoclasm controversy regarding icons and images in the church. So now I I gave a, a talk on this uh um, separately. So I'll keep this really short here for now, but basically what happened was there was, um, a, you know, a, a significant group of people who believed the church should not have images, should not have icons. And that, um, to the point where they even had a, uh, so this is happening between 726 and 843 is the, the dates where, where this was really, really a problem. And so, you know, they were going around and, and, you know, Emperors were were putting in puppet patriarchs to to you know to push their agenda. I mean, they're going in there. They're 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 destroying monasteries. They're destroying churches. They're killing monks. They're putting people in jail. You know, exile. And this is where we really see a lot of of problems. And this you know increases tensions with the West because the the uh, the patriarch of the West, right, the Pope of Rome, is is fighting with this patriarch who people see as illegitimate. And then the emperor is fighting with the Pope and the blah, blah, blah. You know, yeah. it's a mess. It is a complete administrative and spiritual yeah. mess. Okay? It, was so, it was so bad that it led to the, the Pope appointing an, an emperor for the West for themselves because that's how bad it was yeah. uh, with the East. And that's the, you right. know, the first Holy Roman Emperor, Charlemagne, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in the ninth century. That's how bad it got that he said, I'll, I'll just appoint my own emperor because... Uh, <laughs> It was it was really tough. It was really tough at that time. Right, right, right. It was just it was a bad time. Okay, and so then yeah. to the point where so in seven fifty four, um, they have what's known as the headless council. Um, the, yeah. the, the the like we'll just call him like so the emperor calls a council, but he doesn't invite Rome. He doesn't invite you know Antioch, Jerusalem. Right. Like, it's a fake. It's a total. It's a fake thing. And basically, they say the um. The only physical representation of, of of Jesus Christ we can have in the church is the Eucharist. Period. You know, and and no images, nothing, right? And so, but then, um, you know, uh, Christians and you know Orthodox Christians, true Christians, being who they are, didn't stand for it. You know, we know what the true teachings are. Yeah, and this is the Council of Hyria, right? Is Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Robert. so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we so 754, right? We can put it put a name to it. There you go. And then um, so then ultimately in 787, we have the Seventh Ecumenical Council, the defense of orthodoxy, right? The the Akano duels win the day. But then of course, like I always joke, like any political or administrative decision, right? That council happened in 787, but iconoclasm doesn't officially end until 843. Right. Okay. So we have some lag time there, you know, um, in, in order to clean house. Right. But, um, so then ultimately we get this, um, you know, we get this victory and, and we see iconography win, win the day. But now out of this bad stuff, some good stuff ended up happening. There was a further um, push for this um, representational mystagogy, right? This, this um, typology, right? This mystical typology where we see from Maximus the Confessor and then now in later times like Germanus where we're really leaning on this idea of like heavenly 
and cosmic typology where if we read in like the letter to the Hebrews and in uh, Revelation, right? Like this very, very non-literal interpretation, right? This idea of representation. And this is where we really find like, you know, where we're saying, okay, so the Rapidia, you know, the fans like represent this and this entrance represents that. Um, and there's a great text um, that we'll put in the in the uh, description, right? There'll be links to a whole bunch of text, but there's one um, modern um, commentary on the divine liturgy that puts all of this together. So you can kind of read this and see like what these guys were talking about um, and all this stuff. Um, and so then we see now um, uh, the uh, by the 10th century, the Typicon of the great church that we mentioned before, right? Hagia Sophia, that's complete. There's a complete liturgical rite for the first time we can, so, you know, for the first time academically, we could say, yes, there's physical proof that there was what is known as the cathedral rite, which ultimately will become what we know today as the Byzantine rite. But there is like this core that we can look to and say, okay, here's where we're at, right? Okay. So we're like- In the 9th century, right, Father? And that's what? The, this is in the 9th century, you said? Uh, 10th, 10th. The 10th century, okay, wow. Right, right, right. So by the 10th century. And then we see in- Ironically enough, once again, later homilies and later writings by uh, St. Uh, Simeon of Thessaloniki, that looking back, that we have this cathedral rite in the 10th century. However, it did not survive the Latin occupation of the East in uh, 1204 to um, 1261. Uh, it really didn't survive it unscathed. However, well. okay, however, uh, thank God for monks, because yeah. what we see from the iconoclasm controversy is that that was really a monastic victory, right? It were the monks who, who were able to keep these things, you know, to keep the icons, to keep that true faith and to hold on to it. And then like, kind of, I don't want to say give it back, but you know, they were the keepers of this and then came back. So this is where we see now all of a sudden with this Latin conquest and all of these things, this, this real, uh, influence um, coming from the monastic world. Okay. So now, right. So the monastics, think about it, right. So there, you know, would be, I would say more, I don't want to say, oh, they were more educated, right. But they were the ones who were, 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 were able to perhaps read, you know, who were, were really like the more, um, not so as intellectuals as we would say today, but you know, they were the ones praying unceasingly. They were the ones who knew these prayers. They were the ones who were living the full liturgical cycles of the church, right? And living the life and living the angelic life on the earth. So what we see now, and I'm going to kind of, I don't want to say gloss over this, but this is a confusing period of several hundred years, right? Where we see a lot of uh, disparate sources, right? So basically during this time now, so we're looking in like, um, you know, the, the 8th through the 10th century, right? Maybe the 11th century now. The, in these later periods, what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing uh, redactions of uh, the Chrysostom and Afro prayers that we know today in our divine liturgy. So we're seeing them being sort of like compiled, reduced and, and put into this more functional um, mode. But then we're also seeing uh, assimilations between the basal and Afras and the Chrysostom anaphoras. And then also we see during this time, the anaphora of St. Basil becomes sort of like relegated to the 10 times a year that we uh, celebrate that liturgy today. So the six Sundays of the great fast, right? And then we have uh, the vigils for uh, Nativity, Theophany, and Pascha. And then also on Holy Thursday, right? When we commemorate the quote, institution of the Eucharist, if we want to use such language. Um, right, so, so, so we see these things start of, of taking form. Now, there are two monasteries um, specifically where we see this work coming from. The um, the Monastery of St. Studios, which is, um, you know, we can call it, for lack of a better term, like Greek. <laughs> and then we have the Monastery of St. Sabas, which is Palestinian and follows more of the Jerusalem rite, which we haven't talked about. But okay. this is where this comes in, because now what we see is remember those things I mentioned, right? The octoicos, right? All those hymns for the right. tones. And then we have the triodian, all the prayers and hymns for um, the great fast. And then same thing with what is known as the 
um, Manaean, which is every month for the saints of the day for each month. All of this stuff between the eighth and tenth century is being compiled from disparate sources to one source by these monks in these monasteries, right? Which makes complete sense because we have this idea of, of I mean, well, where do we get the term, you know, clerical work from, right? The written work, the compiler, clerical work, because the right. clerics were doing this, right? The monks and the clerics, they were literally doing this work. So when I make a mistake in my bulletin, which is like every other week, <laughs> uh, I always tell people it's a literal clerical error, okay? A literal clerical error. <laughs> Wow. So, so then would it be yeah. true, Father, because you mentioned the monastery in Jerusalem, uh, that, does that mean that the Byzantine rite um, in, their, in their hymns, they have influence from uh, a Syriac influence? Is that correct? I, I would get, I mean, I wouldn't know. I would, I don't want to speak out of turn and say Syriac per se, but uh, what we do see in this period and what Taft says at the very beginning of his, of his thing, what I mentioned in the, um, the talk is that yeah, basically the the Byzantine rite that we know today is a cross pollination of Constantinopolitan uh, Constantinopolitan uh, rite and the Jerusalem rite, which would encompass all of that kind of you know Syriac, more Middle Eastern okay. influence, right? And so, I mean, I'm not a liturgical theolog uh, okay. you know, liturgiologist like officially, so I I can't speak on that too much. But I mean, yes, we can say that there's all kinds of cross pollination happening. Okay. You know, it's not, there's not her, there's no like hermetically sealed uh, yeah. kind of thing, right? Yeah, so definitely. Um, but then also what we see here now, right, is like, you know, all of these things being compiled as well as all your various hymns and um, the uh, the katismata, the um, uh, the groupings of psalms that we pray and matins and vespers and all of these different things, right? We see all of this coming together. And we also, right, at the turn of the second millennium, we finally see that rule book, the Tipicon, <laughs> everybody's favorite book, the Tipicon coming because you can't just have all this stuff without having some type of order, right? Yeah. Some type of, of system to direct it. And so we see all this coming, but then we also see some changes in architecture because what if we talked about, you know, plague um, at one point, Taft makes a point that there was like 10 earthquakes in a very short period of time or something like that. Um, you're talking about warring nations, right? You know, Muslim conquest, Latin conquest, all this stuff. I think the last thing you're going to be doing is stational liturgies all around the city. You know, you're going to kind of be, you know, we're talking about iconoclasm where, you know, people from within the church are murdering other people, right? There's political intrigue. You know, you're going to kind of pull back a little bit. But then in these monasteries, uh, what we see is... Um, sort of this condensing of the liturgy all to one building, right? There's no more separate, for the most part, separate baptistry, no separate um, building for the prothesis. There's not all these great porticos and entrances. You know, you go in, you got your vestibule, you got your nave, you got all your stuff happening in the holy place. And, you know, we see this, but then we also start to see iconography shift to a more um, common representation that we would know Today, so if you go look at iconography from like you know the pre-iconoclasm from you know third, fourth century, it's going to look a lot different from stuff you're seeing in the ninth, tenth century, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a topic for another <laughs> you know another time. But you know, take note of that. Um, so now we've hit that point, the Middle Byzantine synthesis, where we're really seeing all of the um, all of these things um, come together to synthesize, right? All of what we've talked about um in in this crazy fire hose of history and liturgy um is is coming together right so now what we see because things are being consolidated in like the 12th to 15th century this stuff is starting to push north now into uh rus and um and muscovy which we'll use the proper term because it wasn't you know necessarily moscow yet you know there wasn't russia and all this right so up into the into the ruses and into muscovy and all of that all of these things are starting to get push forward and become further and further accepted, right? So now um, in this time, we also see what's known as the uh, the uh, toxis, which is the, keeps order. It means it's the order, right? Or what we would refer today in Latin as the ordo, which is basically what you can and can't do in liturgy, right? They're called rubrics, okay? So it basically tells the priest or the celebrant what to do, like everything. Like you'll see in the liturgy, you know, when the priest, uh, you know, 
uh, raises his hands, when the priest puts his hands down, when he lifts the veil, when he's, you know, uh, waving the air over the gifts, but then when he puts it down, right, all of these things are prescribed. Right. And now, um, priests, unlike, you know, I mean, just pretty much like everybody, priests like to take liberty sometimes, right? People like to take liberties. They like to have fun with it, right? But right. I guess in places like Mount Athos, you know, people were having so much fun with this stuff that there was these, these like exaggerated developments and the preparation rights and people doing all these things and Lord knows what it was. But this is when we really see monks and, and priests and really pushing this idea of like, we have to have order here. Like this is getting too crazy, right? So we're really seeing all of this synthesized now, which then finally brings us to the very last part of this crazy discussion. And I promise I'll uh, digest this all at the end very quickly, very succinctly, <laughs> you know. So um, what now we're just really seeing a heavy, heavy cross-pollination by the, by the 12th century, right? We're seeing the influences from, get this, all of a sudden, the Sabaitic monasteries, right? The monastery of St. Savas, those things that they're doing there are strongly influencing the studios monastery stuff so much that it's kind of pushing the studio stuff out of the way. And we're seeing more of, you know, sprinkles of, of, of stuff from the Jerusalem, right. Entering in and, and all of these things. Okay. So both in monasteries, but interestingly enough, um, Taft points out in Constantinople as well. So that's, that's pretty interesting to see all of this. Right. And so then by the 13th century, now, we're really getting into, I can't believe I'm going to say this, more modern stuff, <laughs> right? The 13th century, right? So we're seeing more of like, you know, um, influences of, of hesychasm, right? Of noetic prayer, of, of not so much, you know, because, you know, uh, we have the whole thing with uh, Gregory Palamas and Barlam, right? right? And this also, so that argument then influences what's going on in the Great Lavra um, on Mount Athos and, you um, they sort of begin to adopt these neo-Sabaitic reforms, which is very influential. And then by the end of the 14th and into the 15th century, we see um, very clearly, we have record of the uh, Slavonic manuscripts adopting all of these kind of reforms too, okay? Sure. So, so we see that. And so then, you know, by the 15th century, like wholesale, um, we see this being done in Moscow and Novgorod and uh, Solovsky and all of these places. So. All of a sudden now, we have this entire journey from disparate communities in the very beginning of Christianity, right, to this metropolitan Constantinople, imperial, huge, beautiful, pomp, glorious celebration to this sort of collapse of society in a way and a restructuring but then we have the beautiful influence of monastics and their prayer and their sort of synthesis on how these things can all come together. And then that gets disseminated across the, the world. And Taft, his very last paragraph of this, of this uh, beautiful essay, he says the following. By the 16th century, local usages had given way almost everywhere before the new system. By the 17th century, the Venetian printed books were in general use, and the formative period of the Byzantine rite as we know it had come to an end. The neo sebaitic usage in its 14th century Athenite codification, basically the rite of the great Lavra during the Abbacy of Philotheus, not only represents the triumph of Hezekas monasticism over the urban studite variety, if we accept the local maintenance of the occasional studite usage, especially in southern Italy and Rus, it has also become the right of world orthodoxy. And it is what we know still as the Byzantine rite today. Whoa. So that's heavy, right? Like, so, so the thing with this essay, what I presented before you all today is like a fire hose, right? Of complete, of, of all this stuff. And it's not important to necessarily remember like every word I said or every word that Taft said, but now it's like slowly piecing together this intellectual puzzle, 
right? Yeah. Of, of what this all means. And so we see from what Tav says here in this last paragraph, that last sentence, right? And uh, it has become the right of world orthodoxy. And it is what we know still as the Byzantine right today. Uh, so that what that means is basically anywhere where you see a quote Byzantine liturgy, they are using the core of, of this. So whether it be now, um, you know, I'm not trying to be um, any kind of like polemic here or anything like that, but you know, whether you see it in a true like Byzantine expression within the Byzantine uh, Catholics or any of the Eastern Catholics or in, in, in the Orthodox, you know, Greek or Russian, whatever, all of it, regardless of the, the modern sort of, we'll say, you know, the, the contemporary expression comes from this core of, yeah. of this formative period, right? That we talked about this about a thousand years. And, and it's just, it's this wonderful thing. Now, right, what do we see? You know, we always get the thing, well, Father, in this Antiochian church, they do this. And well, in this Greek church, they do that. And well, you know, in this Ruthenian church, they're doing the Ukrainian church. Well, yeah, because they all have their little things that they're gonna do, their little rubrics, their little differences. But that doesn't change the fact that what you're doing at the core is the is the Byzantine liturgy, right? right? So right. so we're all gonna have these little differences. We don't have to worry about that. Accidental, but, yeah. Yeah, right. It doesn't, you know, they're just they're just, you know, have their little um, I heard somebody say this and I don't necessarily like to use this analogy, um, but it's always stuck in my head when I talk about this, their own little flavor, right? They all have their own little flavor. I, I don't like to think about it. It's like, like Ben and Jerry's, you know what I mean? That's, that's actually the exact <laughs> word that I used last night on the Zoom call. Oh, really? Okay. Explaining to uh, how the liturgy is developed, right. explaining that there are certain differences that are uh, just accidental to the time periods, the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the regions of the world, yeah. the way the culture developed and language. And I said, so uh, the point that I was making was the Catholic Church is one that it's universal. And that's proven by the fact that you go to all these different regions of the world and you get the flavors of the regions of the world and, and, their, and their culture and customs um, uh, in the development of their liturgies. Right. And like, it was very interesting for me, uh, because at our, our seminary in, in Pittsburgh, um, we also have uh, some, at the time when I was there, we had one um, Romanian uh, seminary and Romanian Catholic seminary. We also had several Melkite uh, seminarians yeah. for, for, you know, the eparchy of um, Newton. And it was very interesting for me to get to see, because we would do, they had this uh, system where we would do Ruthenian services and Melkite services proportionally to how many Ruthenians and Melkites we had. So like, let's say two right. days a week, we would do Melkite services. And it was yeah. really interesting to see like, oh, I see how this is the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, but wow, like we don't do this at all. Like that's crazy how their their little part is structured here or how yeah. we do this and we do that. And it was just like really eye-opening to see right. that. But ultimately, <laughs> oh, go ahead. And I was going to say, for those that may not be aware, the, the, the Melkite uh, uh, Catholic Church is uh, basically the Catholic uh, equivalent to the Greek Antiochian Church of the Orthodox, basically. Um, uh, that's correct, right? The Melkites are the... Yeah, Antiochian. yeah, more so. Yeah, they're definitely more right, yeah. um, along, um, along that line, yeah. Right, yeah. And they both use the Byzantine rite, the, the Melkite, the Ruthenians, the, you know, regular Greek, they all use the Byzantine, right? Exactly. Yeah. So this is sort of, you know, that this, this liturgical story here that I, that I gave, you know, it's really, it's, 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 it's the story of our, of our right. collective evolution, right? Our collective history, right. regardless of where we're from and how we discover it. And I think there's a, there's a beauty in, in all of this. So, you know, I have a couple of notes written down. And so like, what does this mean for us today? All of this historical stuff? Well, you know, I'll sort of like bookend this with what I said at the beginning, where, what does it mean? It means, well, this is important, right? To, to so many people. I mean, how many countless people risked their lives, you know, and, 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 you know, and died in martyrdom, perhaps, you know, we always know of like the martyrs in the martyrology and the saints of the church, but how many people who died nameless, right? How many, mothers and fathers and children lost their lives defending the true faith, right? And so, so that has to be us, right? When we discover this and when we realize like, wow, okay. So just in like, what is this little 83 page? I mean, that's, that's a big essay, right? But like a little 83 page text encapsulates uh, a summary of that whole history. So within here, you know, are all the real life people who, who, 
lived the truth so hard they died for it right and that's and that's what we have to do and and the only way to do that i think is to you know experience it for yourself for those of you who are who are listening who have no idea what i was talking about um you know and are totally confused don't be overwhelmed you don't have to know any of this to set foot inside a byzantine church right you don't have to you just go in and don't even worry about the book just go in and pray right just go in and watch and then go in again and go in again don't just let it be a one and done you know and and you learn how to to live this life and and um you know and then we just apply what we know to our faith we apply what we know to our prayer we apply what we know to our spirituality and we we pray and we hope that one feeds the other right that our intellectual brings us closer in in spirit but then the spiritual maybe makes us question like hey father why do you do this or why do you do that or what happens here you know and and the short answer is well because that's what the book says but <laughs> the reason the book says what it says is because of this exactly <laughs> right uh, mm-hmm. and so now to 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 help those out who might be more of like the um of the uh you know intellectual curiosity or even if you just want to thumb through some sources um i'll just go through them really quick like five seconds of saying like hey this book is good for this this is good for that and we'll put links down in the description so so if you i would recommend you know taking your time and reading the the taft essay the byzantine write a short history you know a short history yeah 1200 years right (laughs) right. (laughs) yeah and so now uh this text uh the orthodox liturgy by hugh wybrew is um it's pretty good um it's pretty accessible um what i like about it is it has pictures and diagrams <laughs> so you can look at something like what like the earlier churches might have looked like and it gives an evolution of the eucharistic liturgy um but now this book um by Hermann gregorios is a commentary through the fathers of the divine liturgy and this is an amazing text for anybody who wants to know like what's going on um, in the liturgy, because what it does is it couples like is um, physical, like, hey, the priest does this here, but this is why. Oh, and here's what, you know, like um, St. Germanus has to say about this, you know, in his mystical typology or this. And it explains like, oh, you know, at the great entrance, this is happening. And it's like, you know, um, uh, you know, it's, you're, you're bringing the gifts up and that's Christ's pr- procession up to Golgotha and then into the tomb and you're entering into the holy, like that kind of that kind of stuff. Right. So it's really good, I think, for a, a beginner um, wanting to understand, but then also a seasoned person, to maybe deepen their spirituality a little bit, be exposed to some of the church fathers in a very um, accessible way. No, no, that book I need to get my hands on. I yeah, really- absolutely. It's a great book. It's a great, a great teaching tool. And I'll be honest, like I read it sometimes again to sort of just like, you know, reset myself, you know, a little bit. Um, and now here's another um, another Taft book. This is a little more academic, but if you're interested in knowing the ins and outs of like the divine office and Vespers, Matins and the liturgy and all of the, um, you know, the, the little hours and stuff, this gives a ridiculously um, dense, uh, <laughs> you know, explanation of, of all of that. But then if you're interested in, in, in stuff like a little, um, earlier, like we talked about that paleo uh, Byzantine era and stuff. If you want to see like where our prayers sort of developed from, from more like Hebrew origins, there's two uh, different books um, by uh, Gregory Wolfenden. There's um, a daily liturgical prayer. It's just the origins of our prayers and like the theology of the prayers. And then uh, finally, this is a pretty good like overview. Um, the, the search for the origins of Christian worship by Paul Bradshaw. Um, that's also pretty good. And these, these books are, um, you know, this, this will really help with like understanding if, if we can really truly understand the whole, um, hang up between like, when did Christians stop looking like, you know, first century Jews and started yeah. looking like Christians, you know, and praying like Christians. Yeah. Like, I don't mean to be derogatory about that, but you know well, what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, where, when did, when did we stop being that Hebrew expression and start being the Christian expression, yeah. Well, well, one of the things that you said that fascinates me, Father, is you mentioned how in in Constantinople, they would begin at one church and they would have a procession going to another church and they would make a grand entrance into another church, uh, you know, and this was, you you said that it was the night before and then they would go in, right? It was at Mm -hmm. night when they would do this. That makes me think of, uh, you know, in the first century, uh, you know, in the time of the apostles, they would begin 
actually at the temple in Jerusalem, at the Jewish temple, with the liturgy of the word, and then process out to go to the house of the local bishop for the liturgy of the Eucharist. So uh, that's what that reminded me of. And uh, so that's it. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up, that uh, there's a, a good resource for when did uh, the church make that uh, full uh, transition, if you call it, from looking like, a, uh, you know, like first century Jews into looking to more of, uh, modern Christians. Uh, so I found that fascinating that, that they would do those transitions from church to church. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then um, I guess just to, to round it out, too, you know, when we really start to like look into like what happens in the divine liturgy and in our services and we notice things like like rando things let's say we'll call them right we're just like why does the and this is a common one i know but like why does the priest say the doors the doors and wisdom let us be attentive well that one that signifies you know all of those who are non-baptized they got to leave you know so they would have like there was so much moving like physical moving and chaos you know in in these liturgies so imagine like, you know, you were at one church, you were been there praying all night, then at that service, there's a dismissal, right? Where they say like, you know, bow your heads to the Lord and blah, blah, the priest gives the blessing yeah. and then everybody starts going to the next church. But then what happens when we see the little entrance today, right? In our divine liturgy, right? The deacon, wisdom, be attentive, right? Or, or attend or whatever the, the, the translation you're going to be using in your respective church. Well, why is that? Because what happens? We say after that, come, let us worship and bow before Christ. Basically, what that means is, hey, shut up. Something really important is going to happen. We're all entering now. We're going to be worshiping Christ. And then, you know, and then after the creed, right, or before the creed, you know, they say, you know, the door is the door. So we take all the catechumens out who are unbaptized, right, because they can't, you know, they're not going to be praying the creed yet. They're not there in their catechism. So they're all, they leave and everybody goes. But then in the divine liturgy, right before the reception of the Eucharist and the Eucharistic prayer, what the priest turns to everybody, peace be to all and with your spirit, bow your heads to the Lord. And then there's a dismissal prayer. What that is, is all of those who were present at the liturgy who were not to receive the Eucharist that day would then leave. And only those staying would receive the Eucharist because if you weren't going to receive, what's the, the point, right? So we have these remnants of all this moving <laughs> that happened, but there's no more moving, right? We just, everybody stays the whole time. That's And it's not that it's bad. That's just like the modern the modern ethos, right? Everybody just stays, you know, we're all welcome, you know, what have you, but it's just a different understanding. But the fact that these ancient things still exist in our liturgy and we don't know why is a crime as far as I'm concerned, because I said, it's a shame, a crying shame that like all of this stuff, I didn't learn till I went to seminary. Right. You shouldn't have to go to seminary to learn this stuff, Right. Yeah. you know, but we're seeing more, I think, uh, in, in people who are coming over to the faith and the youth of today, you know, a more active intellectual part of their faith, but just a more uh, like a deepening part of their faith where they want to know they're curious, you know, and, and, you know, God willing, we'll have more and more priests who are willing to spend the time to give uh, these answers, you know, and people who want to hear it and people who want to talk about it. Well, well so, Father, thank yeah. you so much for, for all of the resources that you've uh, provided as well. We're going to put links in the show notes to everything that you uh, that you provided. I also brought a, a, two books here that I wanted to share, too. Mm -hmm. um, this book is called, um, it's by Donald Atwater. It's uh, The Christian Churches of the East, and this is volume one. This mm -hmm. book, is it was uh, published in the, uh, in the 60s. So mm -hmm. this book is out of print, but if you can get your hands on this, just for the audience... This book is on loan to me by, by Father Chris, Father Chris oh, Zuber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And he said, uh, this book's out of print, so don't think you're going to hold on to it. You're going to bring it back. <laughs> okay, Father. But really good. I learned a lot about um, not just the Byzantine rite, but all of the uh, all of the rites of the Catholic Church. And it's a really good, very brief uh, summary of the liturgies and how the, what the liturgies look like. So this book is really good. Uh, the Christian Churches of the East. This is volume one. Churches and Communion with Rome by Donald Atwater. And then this book right here, Father, which I've already showed you. I sent you pictures of this. This is a huge book. This I just got for Christmas. It's Liturgy, the Illustrated History. Um, this book right here is, it has, it's huge. It has everything. So this is a fantastic book as well. A good resource for uh, for people too. Um, and it's beautiful. There's illustrations in here. It's, it's absolutely uh, uh, gorgeous. And um, so all of these books, all of these resources, we're going to put in the description for, for everyone, for everyone who wants to uh, learn uh, about the liturgy. And, and Father, I cannot thank you enough for, um, 
for taking the time out of your out of your schedule to sit with me and to explain all these things to me. I learned a lot. There were many things that I that I had no idea. I didn't know that the development uh, ended there in the 15th century. Um, I didn't know that it took that long. Uh, you know, from the time of Saint John Chrysostom and and Saint uh, uh, Basil the Great all the way to the uh, to the to the 15th century is is incredible. Which is it's it, the irony there is. Um, that the development ended right around the time that Constantinople fell, which is right. the big irony, right? That mm -hmm. we finally have this complete, robust, uh, uh, you know, rubric and and and, and form of, of worship that came from this great thousand years of of navigating through her uh, navigating heresies and and responding to uh, you know uh, the iconoclasts and 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 you know. The Muslims that were taking over, and and of course all of the imperial stuff, and once it finally all came together and it was preserved by the great monks, and it was finally preserved at the time when Constantinople fell. So I, that there's something very, uh, I don't know if you would call it poetic or if you'd call it, uh, uh, you know, it's like the liturgy is like the uh, 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 the lasting uh, remnant of 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 the Byzantine Empire. Um, and and that's what we have left of it in a sense is because we don't even have the Hagia Sophia anymore. Right. We don't have the yeah. Hagia Sophia, but we have the, the liturgy that was developed there, you know. Um exactly. So so uh the Byzantine liturgy really is a uh, a gem and a and a remnant and something that has uh transcended even you know the Eastern Roman Empire that we, we saw it's it, it outlived everything else, you right. know. Um so I learned so much, Father. Thank you for all of the knowledge that you've imparted on me and, and all of the uh, uh, listeners, all of the viewers today. You always have an open invitation, Father, to come back onto my onto my channel because I know I know my my, my viewers. <laughs> they're gonna just come up with more questions, Father. They're gonna well, come up with more questions. So I would love to have you back on so we can get those questions answered. If, we yeah, can just if you're yep, yeah, if you're willing to have me back, I'm I'm willing to come back anytime. Yeah. If, you know, as long as as long as the people like me. <laughs> who, who wouldn't, brother? Who wouldn't? You, you have just given them in in this time in a, a little over an hour. You have given them what I have not been able to give them since you know March of last year, almost a year. In one hour, you gave them more than I've been able to give them in the entire year. So, father, they're gonna love you, father. And and actually, father, please put a plug in for anything that you have going on. Tell us a little bit about maybe the parish where you where you work. Mm -hmm. uh, and promote yourself, Father. If well, there's anything okay. else you want to direct the audience to, to where they can find you or 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 uh, and maybe interact with some of your work, uh, please let us know all about that. Oh sure, yeah. Well, I've just started a um, a very very uh, fledgling uh, Instagram, which is totally not even like up and running yet. I'm trying to you know figure out some of this stuff, but it'll be, it's called uh, Father Spiritual, uh, and I'll, oh, I'll, I'll I'll be in touch with you. You know, we could we could do that. Keep a lookout for uh, uh, Father Spiritual. Uh, he'll he'll be coming to you um, because spirituality and spiritual direction and um, um, living a life of prayer is like is really where my interests lie, you know, and where my spirituality is. And so I kind of want to share that experience, um, you know, with those who are, who are willing to, and wanting to uh, come along for the journey. But also I am the, um, I am the pastor at two parishes. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to do double duty. Um, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, Byzantine Catholic Church in Levittown, which is a Philly uh, suburb, but then also uh, Holy Trinity Byzantine Catholic Church, which is in the North end of Philadelphia in the Cheltenham area. So if you're, in that area, you want to check us out. Um, the website is olphbyzpa.org. Um, and so that's where you can get information um, from us. But also, if um, you want to put down in the um, uh, in the in the description of the video notes, um, my email there is pastorolph at gmail.com if you wanted to, to, to reach out, you know, um, and, and find out about our services or anything like that. Um, other than that, I mean, I just want to say that synopsis you gave at the end there of, of the talk, that is beautiful and speaks to what we really need to be concerned with, um, here is that what was that whole process? It was people holding a small ember in their hand and blowing on it right in the face of adversity. And what do we hear today? Cries of, oh, the church is under attack. The church is failing, right? People are leaving. Oh, some people are coming back, but but all of these things, and it's such a hard time, and the church isn't growing. Well, 
maybe it's our job to be the bearers of that ember like our forefathers were. And right now we're just blowing on that ember, keeping the truth, you know, until that fire ignites again. And, and that's, that's what we see in the divine liturgy. So, so if you go to check out a liturgy, know that, that that's what you're participating in is not only, you know, divine worship, true worship and right worship, but you're also participating in the history of people who were willing to go out of their way to blow on this little ember to keep it alive until that spark becomes a flame again. So that's, that you know, that's where we're at. <laughs> well, and now that you have put it in such a beautiful, eloquent, poetic way, and now that you've let the world know uh, where, you know, your two parishes, do not be surprised, Father, if you get just a hold of, if you're flooded uh, with people that are visiting your parishes now uh, after they've seen this, I know I have a lot of, of viewers in the, in, you know, up in the, in the East Coast. Um, don't be surprised, Father. Now you just get a whole bunch of new faces at your at your parishes. Uh, now, especially after you've put it in such a beautiful way, who wouldn't want to go and at least experience it? So, yeah. uh, Father, once again, I cannot thank you enough for uh, taking the time to, to, to educate all of us. Um, I've learned so much and I've had a blast. I, I wish we could keep going. But like I said, you always have an open invitation, Father. And I, I want to get you back on to talk more about this. Talk about, you know, Byzantine, you know, music, Byzantine uh, uh, chant. Um, talk a little bit maybe more about your career um, and just everything, Father. I, I want to learn it, learn it all. So, again, thank you so much. Absolutely. I'm so I'm so blessed to have been invited and, and blessed that this seems to be the start of a great friendship. Um, and I look forward to, you know, God willing, meeting some of your viewers and, uh, you know, uh, just know that the Lord is with us always. Okay. Amen. He's always with us. He's always, always encouraging us and, and, and loving us. And, and, you know, just remember it's, it's divine liturgy is where the heavenly and the earthly meet. So if you really, really need like a break from this world, just come to a divine liturgy, Amen. And find, that, find that refuge and find that escape. And, and please know that, uh, while I noticed you have over 25,000 subscribers, I, you're all in my prayers, okay? All of you. <laughs> Even the ones who don't subscribe, but subscribe for the extra <laughs> prayers, right? No, Thank you so much. No, no simony here. No simony here, okay? Yeah, right, right. So, Thank you so I much. I love you, Alex. Be Thank well. You so much, and if you could just please just give us all your blessing, Father, and we can, we can end it with that. Yes, absolutely. May the blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and loving kindness, always, now, and ever, and forever. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much. Glory to Jesus Christ. And we will see all of you again very soon. God bless everybody. Take care. Thank you, Father. Thank you.